We're all really, really excited about the Lenovo Legion Go. That excitement all started with some leaks that came out before the official announcement of this device. And there was some misinformation in those leaks. And even I got some facts wrong in my last video about the Lenovo Legion Go. So I do want to set the record straight, especially because we are debunking myths today. And this comes courtesy of a Lenovo Legion Go engineer doing an ask me anything on the Lenovo forums. He definitely provided a lot of clarification on some statements points that we have all been talking about i think it's been a really interesting ride there was some stuff that i covered in the nerd nest podcast and that other people have covered but then there were other things that just nobody has been covering from this ama so i want to go through it and the main thing that i saw coming out of this ama is that lenovo really is providing a lot of transparency and confidence and that transparency right now is coming from just this one engineer perhaps but you know it seems like either they don't really care from the PR perspective that he's giving all of this information or they're approving it. Either way, I think that's really good. And again, I think they're displaying a lot of confidence and we'll get into how that is. Of course, like, subscribe, all that nonsense. But first of all, here's a myth I propagated. When I saw the price of $699 for the Lenovo Legion Go, I was wondering if maybe this was the price for the Z1e version, or maybe it was actually the price for the Z1 version. As many of you pointed out, there was a Best Buy page already up. Here it is. It shows $699 for the Z1e. That honestly is an incredible, incredible bargain. One of the reasons I was skeptical is because I think that this price is, again, it's just a really good price for this device, considering everything that comes with it. I know it price matches the Asus ROG Ally, but I just think that with this bigger screen, the controllers that you can take off, there's just a lot that comes with this that I think makes it a nice bargain. Then with the Lenovo Legion Go engineer, as I mentioned, one clarification that he offered is that yeah, VRR is a good thing, but it's not the only thing. He brought up this misconception that VRR is laggy or you're gonna lose frames. And he said that really, when you compare a 48 Hertz VRR screen to a 144 Hertz non VRR screen is really no comparison. And the 144 Hertz non VRR screen is going to win every time. At least that's what he's saying. I do think he makes a good point. Of course, which one you prefer is up to you. I did see a lot of no VRR, no buy, and I just feel like it's not that simple. Definitely keep an eye out for the reviews to see how this actually performs in person, because I do think that 144 Hertz screen makes up for not having VR in a lot of big ways. All right, so next up, I wanted to point out that Legion Space, the software that the Legion Go is running on, is not final. One quote here from the Lenovo Legion Go Reddit is, we only plan to deliver final software released via on the air update closer to the embargo date. So the first people getting the devices, including reviewers, will be advised to update BIOS and Legion Space software right out of the box. That is really important because another thing he mentions is, he says, someone mentioned 48 watts TDP, and the current assumption is actually 20 watts on battery and 25 watts in wallet mode. I know in my video, I mentioned 48 watts TDP. For me, that came from a video I was watching from the Techspert, and that video showed a TDP slider that did go all the way up to 48 watts TDP. And the reason it went up to 48 watts TDP is again, just because Lenovo Legion Space is not final. So this is not an actual mode that's going to be available. In fact, the modes that are going to be available are, like he says, 20 watts on battery and 25 watts in plugged in mode, wallet mode, as he calls it. They are working on a 35 watt mode being available, but it's not a given and it's not a promise. They're going to continue testing that in terms of thermals and noise, and only then will they know if they can provide a 35 watt mode. All right. I think this is my last uh, mess up here. I mentioned a release date of October 23rd. I, I This is a big mess up on my end because I checked my notes and it was October of 2023, not October 23rd. So my mistake on that one, the embargo date is October 31st. You should be able to order around that time or earlier in the month, more likely. So you're, you should be able to order around the early end of October, but we'll see pretty soon. All right, and then interestingly, he talks about the eGPU. There are two full speed USB 4 ports, and the fact that they're USB 4 means that you should be able to use an eGPU with Thunderbolt. The only thing here is that he mentions that they basically haven't tested this yet. 
He says, if you can find one that works, feel free to use it. However, we did not test such scenario. So I do think this is an important subject Obviously, eGPU should just work given that it's USB 4, but the fact that they're not testing it is something to point out. They, they don't seem to be prioritizing this. They're not gonna be aware of what different issues may arise with different graphics cards. So that does feel like one area where the consumer is really gonna be an early adopter for this. One thing to point out too is that eGPU just does not feel like a mainstream functionality yet. It is still expensive and there's just not a lot of use case for the common consumer to do something like this. Maybe that's why they are not prioritizing it, but it's just something to point out if you are one of those people that fall into this use case. All right, next up, we're gonna talk about gyro. So one thing he mentions is that the gyro is just on the main tablet, at least for now. He says gyro is in the main unit, not in the controllers for now. So if you're using the controllers, undocked from the tablet itself, you're not gonna have any gyro functionality. And here's one of those moments of transparency I was alluding to. I don't think we're gonna see many companies be this transparent with sort of the give and take that go into making a device like this. Here he says that the speakers are two two watt speakers and specifically that we do not focus on audio as the main selling point. He, they focus on screen, performance, battery, and controls. So yeah, that's interesting. They're not focusing on audio as the main selling point and that's something to know going into it especially if you're a really big fan of the asus rog ally and its audio because its audio is really really impressive likewise he talks about the decisions that went into the drive that they chose so they did choose a 2242 drive as opposed to the more common 2280 a lot of it has to do with it taking up much more space and capacities that are unreasonable for handheld amounts of power because they generate too much heat the next thing to talk about is how these are not review units. That's really important. It's an important distinction. It, specifically here, he says, none of the reviewers had their hands on the final quality of mass production units. They all had engineering ones, especially those who had early access. They had quite early samples. Uh, one of the people that I think had early access was Dave2D, uh, but yeah, that's just an important distinction here. He also says, this means you see very different finishes on the controllers. The glossy simple plastic are really early samples and matte finishes for later versions. Also, there may be connection issues, things like that. They did mention that the vertical mouse, the right Joy-Con, if you want to call it that, that vertical mouse one, it should be magnetic when it attaches to the hockey puck. So yeah, these are not final. So that's important to keep in mind. One of the reasons that's important to keep in mind is because a lot of people said that the screen is a portrait screen and that's true in the current version of the product, but he does confirm that the final product is going to be a landscape display. So yeah, that's great. Similarly, there are gonna be software updates that come later on. I did mention that Lenovo Legion Space is in an early place right now. He says there is a new software release every week. Likewise, he says that features are gonna continue being added all the way through 2024 and that engineers are gonna work on what they can before the sales date and then they're gonna add more as well. Another big one is the durability. A lot of people were worried about the kickstand and the hinge that's there, but more importantly, a lot of people were worried about the rails for the removable controllers. They've done a lot of tests on the hinges. It says, hope you notice feedback of reviewers on how sturdy the hinges. We tested a lot of the hinge mechanisms and rails mechanisms. And here's a really specific one. It says currently in the five digit numbers count and going up for perspective. It says if you attach and detach controllers five times a day, every day that is a minimum of five and a half years of happy attaching and detaching minimum not average i do think based on what we've seen from the hinges for the kickstand that does look incredibly sturdy lenovo is really good at making like they make really good robust laptops i mentioned before that my son uses my lenovo legion laptop and he kind of just abuses that thing from time to time and it's still going strong but we'll see how well that applies to their handheld once we get closer to release. The next note here is that they provided some good math on the battery life. Here it says, if you turn everything to the max, of course you're not gonna get good battery life. Same as with my laptop, it's math. You have a 49 watt hour battery. So if you set your TDP to 20 watts, then add max brightness screen. So let's say that's five watts to be over the top. Sound is four watts, Wi-Fi is one watt. You got yourself 20 plus five plus four plus one equals 30 watts of total system power. And if you divide that went with a 49 watt hour battery, that's about one and a half hours. And he says you can tune the TDP to seven watts and use the screen in two watts mode. 
and not use any sound. And then you're gonna have about five hours of battery life if you're playing at that TDP with those sort of settings. Really interesting here, he mentioned that there's not gonna be an FPS limiter and he said that that should be a feature of the GPU driver or the game itself, but not a hardware producer. That goes against what we've seen in ROG Ally and the Valve Steam Deck. And here, this user, Project SVC, made some good points. So Project SVC is the developer of Handheld Control Panel, which is a software you can install on Windows on your handheld to have a control panel similar to the Steam Deck that allows you to limit the FPS and change the TDP and things like that. And so what he said is that if Lenovo wanted to create an interface to their FPS limiter, then Lenovo could do so if they wanted to. But yeah, it's just a question of whether or not they want to. I'm not sure, but I do think it would be a helpful feature, so I don't see why they wouldn't do that. Finally, the engineer leaves it on sort of to be continued. There are a bunch of questions he didn't answer. Uh, he mentions controllers holder. He did actually come back to this one, so I'll, I'll mention that in a moment. But there's some other things like the 10 to 12 bit HDR screen, screen hardness, battery life on both the main unit and controller. So he does want to come back and provide some more answers. And I waited a few days before making this video, but he still hasn't provided answers on those yet. So maybe I'll come back another time and provide updates on that. But to talk about the controller holder, Here's what he had to say on that subject. He said that our controllers are bigger than people may think. They're designed to be ergonomic on their own without a holder, but that a lot of people have asked for it. So based on that, they are going to work on a really light plastic connector. Moreover, they are planning to release the 3D printing file to the public so that people can just print their own. He can't promise when this will be done or whether or not they're going to include it by default, but that is good to know that they are going to be working on this. I know a lot of people did want a controller holder. I do as well. But yeah, from their perspective, they just don't feel it's necessary. So really now they're going to start working on it. And like I said, provide the 3D files for that. Overall, I would say that I am impressed with how Lenovo has been approaching this pre-release period for the Lenovo Legion Go. I think that they've sort of gone above and beyond when it comes to answering these questions. I, I think that compared to my experience with the Asus ROG Ally, just the pre-release marketing, um, Lenovo is going out of their way to answer a lot of questions and really, I think, be transparent with their answers. But at the same time, they're projecting a lot of confidence in the choices that they've made and the trade-offs that they've sided with. And I think that they are being upfront with the fact that they really made intentional decisions. Some of them you're gonna like, some of them you're not. And whether or not you like the device as a whole is really just gonna be up to you as a person. So I like that they went for sort of a really unique and sophisticated design. I'm curious to see if they're going to stick the landing, but I'm certainly excited to see how this holds out. What do you think? Are you excited for the Lenovo Legion Go? Let me know in the comments which of these trade-offs are interesting to you. Did they make the right decisions or the wrong decisions? I'd be interested to know your thoughts. All right, that's all I've got. I hope you're having a wonderful week. Deck gang out. Goodbye.